Hi, welcome to the session on interest rate swaps. I'm Doug Carroll. And we're going to spend a good bit of time looking at interest rate swaps in detail. First introducing swaps in general, uh, then looking at the structure of the most common type of interest rate swap, the fixed for floating interest rate swap, but also consider a variety of different structures, uh, pricing and valuation, and applications, both risk management and speculative. So uh, why don't we begin our discussion of interest rate swaps? Interest rate swaps actually fall into a category of swaps known as forward commitment swaps. And not to, to push the discussion of derivatives in general too far, but to place things in context and hopefully allow you to better understand, uh, there's only two broad categories of derivatives, one called forward commitment contracts, the other being contingent claims. And interest rate swaps fall into that first category of forward commitment contracts. The emphasis there is on the word commitment, because in all forward commitment derivatives, and that's true whether they're swaps or futures contracts or forward contracts, both counterparties to the contract are entering into a, a, a legal obligation where they have a, a contractual commitment to do something. And in the case of interest rate swaps, or at least in the plain vanilla version of interest rate swaps, one party is committing to pay a floating rate of interest, the other party is committing to pay a fixed rate of interest. Now, why is that significant? Well, parties are exchanging contractual commitments. And if they're exchanging equal but opposite commitments, what's called an at-market swap or a swap done at fair value, that means that the contract has no initial cost. Now, you might say, oh, that's sort of a theoretical curiosity or oddity. Oh, no, it's way more than that. Because think about it. If parties can enter into a, a position at no cost whatsoever, think of the capital efficiency. Now, we'll talk about these issues in more detail later, but when you can establish a position in the market, you're creating exposure. And by exposure, I simply mean that you've got a position where you have capital at risk. Market moves in your favor, you generate a gain. Market moves against you, you're going to suffer a loss. Well, you can do that, of course, by buying an asset like a fixed income security. But that requires a fairly large commitment of capital. You either have to accumulate the capital on your own or convince someone to lend you the money to take that position in the market. Well, being able to establish an exposure at no cost, which you can in many forward commitment contracts, is obviously extremely capital efficient. So we'll come back and focus on pricing and valuation and later. But having that grasp of the, the central feature of these contracts, that if entered into at market, there is no cost because the parties are exchanging equal but opposite obligations, that actually gives you a couple of steps in the right direction of understanding the basic valuation. And, and just to give you the counterpoint to that, remember I said the other main category of derivatives was contingent claims. Now, I won't go through the laundry list of contingent claims, but the most prominent type that many of you might have heard of before, at least, would be options. And we're not going to go into call and put options here at all, although uh, we might talk about options on swaps or swap options later on in the session. But many of you probably have at least a basic familiarity with what a, a, an option contract is. The buyer of the option acquires the right to do something, right to buy if it's a call, right to sell if it's put. And the seller of the option, also called the option writer, incurs an obligation. Well, think about the very different nature of the forward commitment contracts I gave you a brief description of already and the contingent claims, the options we were just talking about. Unlike the forward commitment contracts where the parties are exchanging obligations to do something, and if they exchange those obligations at current fair value, neither party has an advantage. That's why the contracts have no cost. Compare that to the options, the, the category of contingent claims I've mentioned. Well, clearly that's a very unequal contractual situation. The buyer of the option acquires the right to do something. The seller of the option incurs an obligation to do something. Clearly in a contractual sense, that's not an equal exchange. Well, that's why the buyer of an option invariably has to pay the seller something. So options or contingent claims would almost always have a cost associated with them. Therefore, there's some capital outlay to establish a long position. But unlike the, the forward commitment swaps, which interest rate swaps are the most prominent example of, again, if done at market, and the vast majority of interest rate swaps are entered into at market, that means there is no cost from the standpoint of the participants. And so they can create an exposure that I was describing before with no capital outlay whatsoever. So think of the attractiveness of, of taking a speculative position or establishing a risk management strategy at no effective cost to you. 
clearly very capital efficient. And that's one of the reasons the swap market has grown so dramatically since it first was uh, uh, initiated back in the early 1980s. So we're not going to talk about all these swaps. I'm just putting this in context. But interest rate swaps fall in the category of forward commitment swaps, as I was saying before. And there you see all their uh, close relatives, I guess you could say. So cross-currency swaps, commodity swaps, and equity swaps are, are uh, close cousins of, of interest rate swaps because they all share the, the feature I was talking about, that exchange of contractual obligations. The, uh, as I'd indicated a few moments ago, the, the interest rate swap market or the forward commitment swap market in general didn't exist prior to the early 1980s. So think of the attractiveness the use of such contracts must have because we have a market that didn't exist prior to 1980. In fact, the first swap occurred between uh, IBM and the World Bank. And the World Bank, of course, is not a financial intermediary like a J.P. Morgan Chase or a Goldman Sachs. It's a world financial institution. So IBM and the World Bank decided they had these risk management uh, needs, and they decided to exchange or swap those, those risks. And that was actually the first of the, the swaps we're talking about here today. And so you have a market that didn't exist barely th 31 years ago, and it's gone from non-existence to today being the largest derivative market in the world. Here you see an example of a, a generic forward commitment swap. So this would apply to any of the swaps I just mentioned, not just the interest rate swaps, which we'll talk about in detail, but also the commodity, the currency, and the equity swaps that I said they're closely akin to. And in these forward commitment swaps, the two counterparties, and we'll talk about who those counterparties might be. Typically, one of them is going to be a swap dealer. The other would be a client, uh, maybe an institutional investor, maybe a government agency, maybe a corporation using the swap for risk management purposes. So we'll talk about a variety of circumstance, market participants, and the ways in which they use swaps. But to, to illustrate graphically what I'd said before, you have the two counterparties to the swap, whoever they might be, and once they've entered into that contract, they've agreed to exchange something. Classically, in the, the most basic type of, of interest rate swap, one party is committing to pay a floating rate of interest, and the counterparty is committing to pay a fixed rate of interest. And as it turns out, they don't make those payments in full. There's a netting process that goes on. And again, we'll talk about that in general. But these are the commitments the parties are entering into. They're committing to make payments of some sort, typically a fixed or floating rate of interest. And we'll, we'll talk about the variety of structures later on. But um, both parties are making that commitment. And one way you can think about it, and, and we won't push this discussion too far, because this gets fairly technical, and it has to do with the, the, the theory and practice of pricing and arbitrage pricing relationships between interest rate swaps and, and, and related interest rate instruments and derivatives. But you could think of a, a, of a forward commitment swap as really a package of futures or forward contracts. So if you had a two-year quarterly settled interest rate swap, so again, the contract runs for two years and it settles quarterly, that's four settlements a year, well, that means over the course of the two years, those eight settlement dates, that really could be deconstructed into a package of eight interest rate forward contracts, one deliverable in three months, another in six months, nine months, 12 months, et cetera, quarterly out to the end of the two years. So you don't have to understand swaps from that perspective. And in an introductory level class, it's not appropriate to try to understand swaps that way. But because that is the, really the, the, the economic nature of swap contracts, that means there's arbitrage pricing relationships between interest rate swaps and interest rate forward contracts, or for that matter, interest rate swaps and, and interest rate futures, a specific type of futures known as euro dollar futures, which we'll, we'll talk about briefly later, because that's the way swap dealers will hedge any risk exposures they can't lay off with another counterparty. Uh, but because those relationships exist, that means that the dealers can hedge exposures they can't lay off with another counterparty. And it also uh, indicates that to the extent there's divergences between the values implied in the interest rate swap market and in these other interest rate or related interest rate derivative markets, well, there's arbitrage pricing. So if there's divergence between the two markets, those markets can be brought back into proper alignment by the market participants that recognize that disconnection who will tend to buy the 
the relatively underpriced and short sell the relatively overpriced instrument. And as long as those divergences from fair value exceed transaction costs, they're incented to do that trade, but trading will, will bring those markets back into alignment, thus reflecting more accurately and efficiently the pricing.